All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and get started then. So um, thank you everybody so much as always for attending Sustainable Claremont's dialogue series. We're always so grateful to have everybody here on their Monday nights spending it with us. Uh, so thank you, thank you. Um, before we get started with our amazing speaker today, a couple of really quick announcements. Um, the first is that we are in the, the midst of our year end giving campaign and, um, you know, we're a very small nonprofit and we try to offer things like this to the, the community for free. Um, and the way that we're able to do that is because of some really amazing donors who help us out during this time of year and throughout the year. Um, so if you're feeling inclined, uh, please consider making us part of your giving plan for the end of the year for 2021. And we'll go ahead and put that link in the, the chat box if you're able and willing. We're very appreciative. Um, the second announcement is that um, we have so many events here at Sustainable Claremont. We're going to have monthly plantings coming up in January. We have two dialogues coming up in the next uh, week. We have one on this Thursday. Um, called Nature Nurtures on nature and mental health. And we're going to be co-hosting it with our friends at Tri-City Mental Health. And then one next week on Monday, we have a dialogue on the Regional Recycled Water Program. Um, so the best way to keep up with, with all of the events that we have scheduled is to sign up for our newsletter. Um, we try not to, to bug our, our newsletter um, subscribers too much and really try to limit how much we email you. Um, so please consider just signing up so you can keep abreast of all those um, uh, great events that we have on the horizon. Um, as always, during our dialogue, uh, please feel free to, um, to either put your questions in the chat box as they come up during the presentation. Um, and Nicole and I will, will collect those questions and we'll ask them at the end of the, the presentation. Or if you want to ask the questions yourself, hold on to those until the end of the presentation. And you can either raise your hand or you can unmute yourself. Um, and ask those of Douglas. Um, okay, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, Nicole, who's going to be hosting the rest of the evening. So, Nicole. All right. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I am super excited for this dialogue because foraging is something that I have gotten into recently, and I think it's a really interesting and fun topic. Um, so this dialogue is part of our Green Crew Urban Forestry Program, which is supported by California Relief, Cal Fire, and California Climate Investments. Um, our speaker today is Douglas Kent. He is an author, activist, educator, and specialist in ecological land management. He is a principal of Douglas Kent and Associates and has been working in California's landscapes for over 30 years. He has written books such as Foraging Southern California, A New Era of Gardening, A Guide to Gardening for Oxygen and a Healthier Atmosphere, and Firescaping, Creating Fire-Resistant Properties, Landscapes, and Gardens in California's Diverse Environments. And I'm going to drop links to those books in just a moment. His designs and projects have also been featured in publications across the nation, including LA Times, Sunset Magazine, HGTV, and National Wildlife. So very impressive stuff. And now I am going to pass it over to Doug, who will be leading the presentation. Thank you, Nicole. And uh, thank you, Stuart, and everybody that showed up. I only have... Um, 25 minutes to cover 20 years worth of experience. So <laughs> there won't be much of a preamble here. I just got to get to it. So let's get to it. <clears throat> I hope uh, I hope I'm uh, full screen already. Looks good. So all I'm, okay, thank you, Stuart. I'm going to do a quick introduction, just a one slide introduction, and then I'm going to cover 19 highly useful trees immediately outside of your front door that you can easily find and, and, um, and utilize, and then just a quick discussion about our reciprocal relationship with our environment. So let's get started. The whole emphasis with Sustainable Claremont and what Audubon does and so many of the other agencies across Southern California does is, is try to encourage this participation in nature and to create this symbiotic relationship where we become one with nature. And, and this is brought up in, in our circles. I hear this a lot. that When the colonists came to America, particularly California, 
they didn't find a pristine landscape. What they found was almost a cultivated garden for 13,000 years. The 6 million indigenous Californians had cultivated this, this California landscape that they found and was pristine. And what they saw was a, a deep, knowledgeable hand in nature. And we confuse that with being something other than human. And, and our hand in nature is essential. And it's, it's, it's more than a movement, it's a philosophy and it's a, a personality almost defect. <laughs> and we can see this in way back in the 1700s and the 1800s from Henry David Thoreau to John Muir to the arts and crafts movement, which was a, a knee-jerk response to the mechanization of the Industrial Revolution, to Bill Mullis and John Lyle, where I work at the, the Center for Regenerative Studies at Cal Poly Pomona. And then most recently, um, Robin Wall Kilmer with Braiding Sweetgrass, where she lovingly and just eloquently talks about the reciprocal relationship that we should be encouraging with nature and, and particularly with the nature right outside our front doors, with outside our every day. So here's the things I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to be covering 19 useful trees, but I'm going to talk about a little more than just food because food is neat, but it's um, it's kind of minor. We use so many things <clears throat> in every day, every day, more than just food. And we use craft items, whether it's dyes, paper, fibers. We um, eat loads of food, but we need landscape materials. If you've ever been to the Audubon Center um, in Debs Park in downtown LA, they do a phenomenal job of blending the vegetation into the landscape and repurposing what we call as green waste, but what should be called is a resource. Um, there is so much we can do with self-care. Uh, weeds and, and all kinds of vegetation provide enormous amount of of self-care. Self-sowing, I'm prioritizing trees that um, self-sow or self-propagate tonight because hopping in a car to buy a plant actually, I mean, <laughs> we really got to stop driving to meet our needs and, and, and honor what our mother is actually providing us right outside our door. Um, I'll highlight if they provide really good shade or not, if they have useful timber products. Um, this is a nod to Angel City Lumber in downtown and Boyle Heights and where they repurpose all kinds of urban trees and any kind of adverse health impacts. Um, some of these trees actually do have adverse health impacts. So I'm just gonna get going. The very first tree, these are all alphabetical uh, based on their common names, which is my bro names. Um, and the very first one is uh, the bay or the myrtle wood. And it has incredible craft potential. We make wreaths out of it. Um, the wood, as you know, if you've ever been to Oregon, it's called Myrtle Wood up there, and they make all kinds of stuff, bowls and cups and cutting boards, and it's just a wonderful craft item. It's a dense hardwood that's easy to mill and work with. Self-care, I don't know if you know this, but bay leaf is an expectorant, and you'll find it in both topical and internal medicines to help relieve the condition. So in my house, what I do is I'll just take a bunch of bay leaves that I um, got on my commute home and just put them on a pot of water and just have the house steam with that fragrance and just feel that vibrance and that energy inside of my house. And it really improves feelings of well-being. Uh, the bay, if you get over 22 inches, 24 inches of rainfall a year, will self-sow. And if you're in the Pacific Northwest, it is a great timber crop. It is a hardwood and easy to mill and work with. Um, then there's the bat black locust. Um, the food, it, this is, uh, I don't know if food is a good word. The only real pea family, um, and most of the pea families, beans are edible, but not this particular tree. But the flowers are delicious. So <laughs> those white flowers that you see that just absolutely rain down um, in early spring are uh, like a, they taste like a, a honey tissue paper. So if you're into tissue paper and honey, this is it. Uh, but they look fantastic on any dish. Uh, they look really good. And then they make a really good timber crop. 
um, it's a dense hardwood um, that mills up fairly easy. Um, I live in the city of Orange and we don't get enough rainfall uh, to create the, the girth you need for timber, but you would up against the San Bernardino's or the San Gabriel's where you get 30 plus inches of rainfall a year. Black walnut, um, we are all part of the black walnut community. Um, in the foothills of the mountains. And everybody knows it. One, they're a great craft item. The, the hole itself makes the blackest dye of all the dyes. It's one of the wonderful dyes. Um, and then the wood is hard. It can make handrails and um, all kinds of cups. And it's just a neat craft item. It's a food finding fat and protein foraging for fat and protein is actually really difficult and not easy to find. And this is one of the easiest sources of fat and protein. It, you're going to need a little elbow grease to get to it. It's not an easy crop to get to. But once those pods or once those fruits are mature and have blackened up, uh, they're ready to be harvested. Uh, the picture to the left is an immature fruit, so it needs a little more time. Landscape materials, uh, they are hardwood. Uh, rot resistant, and they do really well for steps, handrails, retaining walls. Uh, they are fantastic for landscape materials. The leaves are also have allopelic agents, which suppress weeds underneath them. So they're great for weed control or to use as a mulch for weed control or weed suppression. They're self-sowing on anything over than 20 inches of rainfall a year. And walnut is one of the best um, or it's the most prized timber crop uh, that we have. Uh, it sells for the most. Walnut absolutely sells for the most. But again, if you're not getting over 25 inches of rainfall, you're not going to get that girth and you're not going to be able to get that timber. So this would be really, you're going to need to irrigate the black walnut for timber. Uh, camphor. <laughs> hey, Doug. How much of a food tree? Yes, sir. Hey, sorry to interrupt real quick. Would you mind maybe switching off your video feed? You're getting a little choppy on my end. Yeah, story of my life. <laughs> Thank you. Choppy. Happens all the time. Yep. Okay, I'm going to keep using my hands though. I just can't help it. So um, camphor, um, which is uh, the common name would, another common name would be the cinnamon tree is great for landscape materials. We use this all over the Lyle Center because it's a dense hardwood, easy to work with, um, and it's fairly rot resistant. Um, it is fantastic for self-care. It's used externally and internally. Um, internally, it's an expectorant again, and it helps clear your breathing airways. Um, externally, it helps soothe the skin and you would use it for um, joint aches or arthritis. Um, so you'll find camphor in all kinds of lotions and lignants and stuff like that. It's self-sewing and it doesn't need much rainfall to prop up. And of all the trees, it provides some of the best shade. It is a dense shader. So this is a wonderful urban tree to, to work with and, and forage. The carob, boy, this tree is, people love to hate this self-sowing tree. It is everywhere, but it provides incredible shade. And sugar is one of the hardest things to forage. Uh, we forage um, aphid poop at the Lyle Center for sugar because it's so hard to find. But this grows everywhere. And you know carob, carob is a chocolate alternative. So it's a stimulant, it's rich with calories and fat and some protein. It's a hardwood, which means it can be used for landscape materials. It is absolutely sewing. Um, I don't have a car, so I commute by bus and bike everywhere. And this carob provides food for me, um, you know, late summer every year, just on my way to work. Um, and then the carob provides incredible shade. I mean, nothing lives underneath the carob. It just doesn't allow any sunlight below. So it, it is a good, practical, urban Southern California tree. The Catalina cherry or all the prunuses are wonderful. Um, it's got great craft potentials. You can see the dyes that we're able to make. Um, you can make this really sunny yellow or a real rich orange um, out of the uh, bark. You just brew up the bark. Uh, the fruit, as you know, is 
sort of tasty. It's kind of tasty if it was uh, jammed up um, and that the seed is actually fairly big. So it's, it's a throw it in your gullet and spit it out sort of thing. But boy, I'll tell you, if you're hiking, uh, it really quenches thirst. Um, it's self-sowing, doesn't need much rainfall. I think over just 16 inches of rainfall and it'll self-sow. And then all the prunuses make a really good timber crop. They're hardwood, rot resistant, um, and they just make a great crop for timber. The Chinese elm. So the food on the Chinese elm is the samara, which is the flightful um, seed little packet there. And these, when they're green, are eaten raw or lightly cooked. But when they're brown, is you just boil them up and soften them up um, and eat them like that. Or you can make a flour out of them. And they're really tasty. They've got a tissue paper-like nutty flavor. Um, and I just grab these because uh, the picture is the Chinese elm closest to my house. And I just grab them as they just fall off and just slightly brew them up. So it's a really good source of protein, a little bit of fat, um, and it's just really fun, fun tree. Uh, it also makes a timber crop. This is, um, th they would call this a boutique timber. So you would make cabinets out of it and um, boxes and bowls and stuff like that. It's a really hard wood that's easy to mill up. Eucalyptus, it's everywhere, whether we want it or not, it's everywhere. Now the blue gum is an expectorant and you can find it in medicines both internally and um, it will help joint aches externally. It helps cool um, the outer parts of your body. Internally, it really helps open up your breathing airway and get rid of that phlegm. Um, just like the bay, I will throw a lot of blue gum in a pot and just boil it up in my house and just let that fragrance fill the house. And you just feel the energy inside that house. You really become enlivened. It just makes you increase feelings of well being. It's wonderful at landscape materials, it does tend to break and fracture. Um, it's got great medicine qualities, it's self sewing. Um, pictured is the lemon scented eucalyptus, and I use this all the time. So when I brew up a fragrance, uh, fragrance has three notes, high, middle, and base, the very lowest. And the high notes are fleeting. And normally, um, lemon scents are high notes. Those are the lemon balm, lemon verbena, uh, just flat out lemon. And they are the most fleeting notes. But when you use the lemon scented uh, gum, it is provides a middle or base note, which means that smell really persist in that fragrance or whatever you're doing. So it is just a wonderful, and you'll find lemon scented gum in all kinds of um, external lotions and um, rubs and all kinds of things because of the long lasting lemon scent uh, part of it. It's a very staturous and pretty tree too. Uh, the, the lemon scented, I don't think is self-sowing. You have to plant that one. The ficus, this is a boy, the California Native Plant Society loves to hate this plant. It's everywhere and it's almost a superfood. The fruit that it produces is just so good for you and so good for your brain and digestive tract as well. Um, from a craft point of view, it's a soft wood, which means that it's really bendable. You can create curvy pathways and curvy borders with the... Um, with the fig work with um, provides high sugars, good dense food, um, and it's self sowing much to the chardon of the California Native Plant Society. And this is right off the Santa Anita River Trail. And yes, I ate that fig as soon as I took that picture. <laughs> manzanita. Oh my goodness! If you've never eaten manzanita berries, they are honey flavored flour. So you just let the berries dry, smash them up, and then you just put them into soups or dishes. Um, and this is my nephew. We were harvesting for a huge meal that we were having in the Sierras and we smashed them up and it was so good um, or the people were so drunk, I'm not too sure, but it just never made it into a dish. People were just eating it straight because it is so rich with starch and sugar. It is delicious. Uh, manzanita is a beautiful wood, so you can use it for all kinds of craft items uh, like door handles, um, handrails, all kinds of stuff. 
Um, it's got some great landscape potential because it is a hardwood and it is fairly almost um, rot resistant. And some of the varieties, there's many varieties of man manzanita um, are self-sowing, but all manzanitas produce edible berries, uh, but not all the berries are sweet. Mesquite. Who doesn't love mesquite and getting your arm chewed up trying to get the fruit? Wonderful craft items because it's a bendable hardwood, which is really hard to find. Not, most hardwoods are really difficult to bend, but this one, the mesquite, you can actually bend it. The food is incredible. One of the highest sources of fat and protein that you can find. It's got a sort of sweet flavor to it. You can when they're old, you dry them out, pound them, and make a flower, which is a little labor intensive. Um, they have some self care potential. Uh, they are really good for a lot of different reasons, especially that seed pot is so good for your digestion. And some varieties, there's a lot of varieties, are self sowing given the right environment. So mesquite is a wonderful tree. And then the pepper tree. This is another tree that's super common in urban areas throughout Southern California. Most of these have not been planted. They are self-sowing. Pictured is the California pepper. And the peppercorns that they produce are edible and delicious. Now, they were used in French cuisine for many decades. And then research came out and said that um, they are really bad for your health. Um, and that just stopped the use and everybody stopped using the peppercorns from the pepper trees. Um, but then research came out and said, well, it really isn't all people. If you have a allergy, then you will be, um, you'll have an allergy, uh, allergic reaction to the peppercorns. Now, this isn't the real peppercorns that you find in the market. Those come from the family of Piper. Um, but there, when I take a group foraging through Griffith Park or through Miles Square Park or anywhere I'm at, or, you know, the El Dorado Nature Center, we find this in abundance and people just love chewing on it. Um, and it's good when you're out uh, backpacking, um, too, because you can even find it that far into the wilds. I just want to bring up uh, self-care. The Brazilian pepper, the bark of it has been used for centuries by Central and South Americans as medicine. Now, I don't know enough about that uh, to prescribe it, but I will give me another year or two and I'll have something to say about that. But the Brazilian pepper actually has some incredible medicinal properties. I just don't know enough about those yet to, to say anything. Pines, without a doubt. Look at all the uses for pines. Craft items, their bark make a, a, I mean, their pine cones make a wonderful dye. These pictures don't do it justice. It's a real light, effervescent pink pine cones. And just dyeing them up makes the house smell like Christmas. It's really a wonderful, engaging. All pine cones are edible. You can break them open and eat the seed. Uh, doesn't mean you'll get a lot of food. Um, naturally, the pine nut is the most edible, but they actually can all be brewed up for food. Landscape materials. It's a softwood, which makes it easy to work with and easy to harvest. Um, they're self-sowing. Um, pictured to the right is the Canary Island pine. To the left is the Scotch pine. Um, and, and as far as landscape materials go, they make an incredible weed-suppressing mulch. Um, so here we can see um, this is the Santa Ana River Trail on to the left, and there's weeds along the entire stretch except for underneath the Scotch Pines. Um, they just suppress weeds so well. So it's just a wonderful mulch to utilize. Uh, the Canary Island is self-sowing, and look at that straight, wonderful trunk. That is what you're looking for in a timber tree. And those trees in downtown Orange are ready to be harvested and replanted uh, for that fantastic timber. In fact, they're getting so tall, they may be a liability. So we have to be the force <laughs> to renew and regenerate. Pineapple guava, who doesn't love this tree? So this flower is the third best flower I have ever eaten. Probably the first is viola you know, the, the sweet violet. And the second would be the hummingbird sage. Um, but this one is like right up there in the top three. In fact, this flower is so sweet and so delicious that the trees pictured, this is where I work at the Lyle Center. 
the flowers are so sweet that we never get fruit on these trees because the students eat the flowers <laughs> before they can set fruit. And it's worth it. You know, if you've ever eaten pineapple guava, it's kind of like a, oh, it's kind of bitter and it's got some tannins and it's, it's, um, it's good, but nothing compared to that flower. Um, so, and you eat the whole thing. Most flowers, you just eat the petals. This one, you eat all the reproductive parts. So you're shoving the whole thing into your maw and just going down and you'll love it. It is just wonderful. And you can find this tree growing all the way into Bodega Bay, well up there. So it, it loves California. I might add though, it is a terrible shade tree. It just don't plan it for shade. Oaks, my gosh, look at this list. Oaks should be one of our number one trees in urban areas if we're gonna create a regenerative urban area. Look at these uses. This is a partnership Oaks have established with us. They're craft items, they're hardwood, semi-bendable, long-lasting, rot-resistant. The food, the acorn is full of protein and fats. Takes a little elbow grease. You've got to get those tannins out of there. You have to leach those tannins out of the acorns. But once you do, that meal is incredibly filling. Landscape materials, some of the oak leaves do have alleopelic agents and help suppress weeds. They are wonderful for borders, steps, retaining walls, handrails. They are, some of them are self-sewing. Um, they provide incredible shade. One of the better shade trees, maybe not the best shade tree for bare feet, um, but definitely a fantastic shade tree um, for streets. And then timber, oak is prized. Um, it's easy to work with, easy, easy to dry, um, and it's just a prized wood that sells for a lot per board foot. Um, pictured is the southern oak. It's not a native. It's just one of the most well-behaved, and you find it all over um, Southern California because it's really well behaved around concrete. Um, and so these are the two oaks that I get my acorns from. Um, and this is just, you know, steps outside of my front door. So I have a nice source of <laughs> fat and protein right outside my door. Redbud. Oh, this is a fun tree to work with. So um, craft items, the bark makes a fun, fun dye. Um, I am able to brew all kinds of colors and it's a rose tan to a rich tan brown. Um, I'm able to get colors out of the food. Maybe that's not the right way to say that. Um, the only edible part is the petals, which just go crazy, you know, early, early February, March. They're one of the first to bloom. And you just eat up the, the flowers and they just taste like tissue paper. There's, there's nothing to them. They don't have much of a flavor at all, uh, but they're so much fun to throw on a salad or a dish. People just love eating it and it, it just, they offer no kinds of taste and I don't even think they have nutrition, <laughs> but they're so much fun to throw in the stuff. So, but I really like the dye of, uh, of the Circus. It's just a good, strong dye. I, you know, when I brew it up though, it makes my house smell like a wet shoe. So you really wanna brew this one up in summer where you can keep everything open. <laughs> Strawberry tree, oh my gosh. So let me tell you, if you've never eaten the fruit from a strawberry tree, it's got two tastes. So when you take the red, you want the richest red berry that you can possibly find. You throw it in there. The first one is tank. And that's gonna make your mouth pop and dry up. And you're gonna wanna spit out that fruit. And that's where first time foragers blow it because they'll spit it out. But if you can live through that tannin flip, what follows is better than blackberry, better than strawberry, and better than blueberry. It is so sweet and so rich. In fact, that flavor is almost like bubble gum in that it will stay in your mouth 10 minutes after eating it. You'll still be licking your chops. It's one of my all-time favorite fruits. And if we have any cooks in this group, um, maybe there's a way we can cook out those tannins to really get to those, those base and middle flavors, um, which are, it's, it's just like ice cream. It is really that sweet. Um, and then from a craft item, you can just see the wood is gorgeous, makes door handles, makes handrails. It makes anything that's highly visible. Um, these are small craft items, so it, it, you're not going to get a big 
girthy product out of this, but the wood is beautiful, especially when it's just lightly sanded and maybe, you know, preserved a little bit to keep that rich red. But you know, that red is really indicative of the high tannins. Anytime you get that real, real rich red, you're going to have a high tannin tree there. And then willow, of all the trees I work with, um, this is the second most used one I use. Um, the craft, it is a hardwood, but you can bend it, just absolutely bend it. Um, and you can make almost anything with it. And I'll show some pictures. Um, and pictured below is what I'm doing here is I'm scraping off the outer bark to use as a dye. And then the inner bark to make twine. So this year, all my gifts are going to be wrapped with um, willow bast instead of uh, store-bought ribbon. And this tree, I have to prune this. This is on my commute. It's blocking the sidewalk. Nobody's maintaining this tree. So I really feel like me doing a predation on this tree is actually keeping the sidewalk open and I get all these benefits. So I'm helping the community and I'm getting all these benefits. It's self-sowing. I find them, I harvest willow on clover leaves, on freeways, <laughs> everywhere. It just pops up. Uh, any kind of, anytime you have deep soil and moisture, you're going to find willow. It needs deep soils. It doesn't do shallow soils. Uh, the health impact. So I do want to bring up though, it's wind pollinated and it drives about 19% of California's population absolutely batty. Um, so it's, it, you know, it's just the pollen is just too much for 19% for of California's population. So I mean, here's the dye. It comes up with this really rich rose tan. I've gotten into a dark brown, but I really like this rich brown. And then here's the some of the twine I just whip up from the, the bast fiber. And what I like about this fiber more than anything, it's soft and supple. So many of the fibers when you're use, working with the palms and stuff really chew up your hands, but not this one. It just happens to love you so much. And then... This is uh, my downtown shop. My little plant shop downtown sells these products that are made. 80% um, of that, which you're seeing from those, is willow. Um, and you can just see it's so bendable and so malleable that it just makes a wonderful crop to do so much with. And this, this tree is everywhere. It's blocking sidewalks. It's on freeways. Uh, it's a tree that needs predation. In fact, it probably depended on it. And then my all-time absolute favorite, I think this plant should be in everybody's garden. This is the one tree that I go to more than any other tree. Um, the berries rank right up there with toilet paper. When the pandemic started, you couldn't find a uh, distillate from elderberry anymore. It was just gone because of its antiviral properties. It is incredible immune booster. Um, you have to distill it. You can eat it raw, but if you eat too many of them, you're just going to clean out your, your insides. So you really need to cook off that diarrhea-causing chemical. But what I use this plant for a lot more is the flowers. The flowers make an incredible tea, which improves feeling of well-being. Really, you'll drink a cup of this. You just dry out the flowers, harvest the flowers, dry them out, make a cup of tea out of it, and it's ranks right up there with dandelion flowers. You'll feel an immediate boost of well-being. Um, and all my classes drink um, elderberry flower tea. Um, it makes a good crafts item. It's a bendable wood. It's not a hard wood. It's actually hollow inside. It's got a pithy middle. And that pith in the middle makes a chewing gum. Native Californians would have pulled out that pith and, and actually chewed it like gum. Um, landscape materials, uh, the, if you've ever smelled an elderberry leaf, it's rancid. It just smells terrible. And so it's wonderful to take these leaves and shove them down gopher holes. Uh, it does a great job of discouraging um, burring animals. Uh, you can also use the leaves as a weed suppressant. It's got some hardy chemicals in there to suppress the growth of weeds below it. Um, it makes the bark uh, makes a wonderful dye. It's really light, light rose. Um, these pictures don't do it justice up close. It's really a neat, neat dye. And then the inner bast, uh, the inner bark, was used for all kinds of ceremonial items um, in native cultures. Um, it's a little cumbersome to work with to make fibers out of, um, 
but it's it's a beautiful fiber. It's rich straw colored, um, which is unusual. Most of them are really kind of dark and gringy. And it's self-sowing. Anything over 15 inches of rainfall a year and you're gonna find this tree. Um, so I'm just kind of wrapping it up right now. What's pictured there is the Tubbs fire, 2018 in Santa Rosa, 40, 22 lives lost. And you can see our relationship with the land in that picture. This woman is motivated. She's got the biggest heart in the world. She feels guilt. I, she feels guilty about her impact on the environment and her philosophy was, well, don't touch anything. Our salvation is found when we leave the environment. And you can see the consequences of this. And we can see this in the tubs fire, the tunnel fire, the car fire, the, the camp fire. <laughs> I could go on the witch fire, the cedar fire, all compliance with state fire code averages about 20 to 25% across the state. People are not in their gardens. We've absolutely lost the way. And, and to give you an example, if I tried to give this presentation 70 years ago, I would have balked. People would have never showed up because everything I just said would have been common knowledge. I would have been sharing information that was already known. We have left the garden. And the thing is with true sustainability, it's a heartache, it's a heartbreak. And we know this at the Lyle Center when we have to clean out our wetlands and, and disrupt habitat. And when we have to replant and revitalize our, our um, black walnut forest, it is a heartbreak and it is a heart sustainer. And that's where we're gonna be found is, is in reciprocity. It is really, we need to nurture a relationship of give and take with our urban areas, especially with the landscapes right outside our door as illustrated in this picture below. We need to find our way back into the garden. And so that's it. That was my, uh, I don't know how I did on time. Here's the cover of my book. And this really, it doesn't, it only has like a handful of trees. It mostly um, focuses on annuals, biennials, perennials, and shrubs. Um, and then these are all the colors I was able to brew up within four miles of my house. So these, I just walked to get these colors. Um, and if so, anyway, there is so much goodness right outside your door. And I just really hope you appreciated it. Um, and if you have any questions, please pipe in. I was so fast there. Right. Did I did I talk too fast? Uh, it kind of cut out a little bit. <laughs> Got a little robot there. Um, but thank you so much. That was very interesting. I learned so much. I had my tabs open and I was looking up trees as you were talking about them because there were so many I didn't know of, um, even after reading your book, which is really amazing. I recommend everybody picking it up. Um, all right, so we'll get into questions. So Bernice had a question specifically when you were going over the lemon gums that you looked the, and the leaf, excuse me, eucalyptus. Um, she just wanted you, if you could verify, does eucalyptus typically have a white slash light bark? Yes. Uh, the, well, there's so many eucalyptuses. The, the lemon scented gum has that white, um, really smooth, smooth bark. Unlike uh, some of the others where you can actually, the blue gum has the bark where you can peel it off. Whereas the, the uh, lemon gum has that smooth, really soft um, bark. So she's right. It is smooth and white. Yes. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, and then Bernice also had the question, are there any trees that would be considered harmful? I'm sure there's plenty of them, but do you know of any that you could list maybe that are most prevalent around us that we should stay away from? Well, the... Um... Well, and, you know, the only one that springs to mind is the Chinese tallow, and it's sort of a weed. We used to use it as a street tree, not so much anymore. Um, it's planted because the seeds actually create this tallow. You can make candles out of the seeds. Uh, I've only done it once, and it's really fascinating. I've made dyes out of leaves, but the leaves are really kind of toxic to handle. Um, so that's the only one. Um, I, I know there's more. Let me, Bernice, let me think about that. That was a good question. I know there's more. Okay, no worries. Yeah. All right. And then next up from Katya, she said, what plants make the purple and green dyes in the last picture that was in the slides? Yes. Okay. So the, the green, oh, I'm sorry. 
the green, the green was um, mint. So that was spearmint uh, with a little alum uh, to bring out the flavor. But the mint, um, it, uh, it, it, it's a wonderful dye. It makes yellow to green, um, but it's a little fleeting. It's not one of the most longest lasting dyes. It's almost more of a stain than a dye. Um, and then the, the blue or the purple, it's actually purple, came from the cochineal bug. And I just scraped that off the prickly pear cactus that um, lives in the Santiago Creek, only three miles from my house. Um, and I can make pink, crimson, and purple out of the cochineal bug. So oh, that is a good question. The, that purple always comes up. Uh, and that yellow, that sunny yellow came from the Chinese tallow and the bright coral came from avocado skins, which mm, okay. I grow avocados in the backyard. So. I know I've been saving up a bunch of pits. I haven't been saving the peels, obviously, because I feel like those are a, lit, a bit more finicky and they're usually dirtier. But I have at least like 20 pits that I've been saving up because I want to dye some sheets that I have that are white, but I want to make them the pretty pink color. Yes. Um, okay. You're You're saving for a year because it's, it takes, <laughs> it takes, you know, if you're doing sheets. You, yeah. 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 No, yeah. I literally have been saving for months and months. I need to put out a call on. A, oh, I can't wait to see him. Yeah. Oh, Nicole. All right. Okay. <laughs> All right. And then Carolyn said, what is your favorite tree? Elderberry without a doubt. Elderberry. Oh, without a doubt. It is just the giving, giving tree. It gives to the environment. It gives to the uh, birds, to the insects, to the pollinators. And it just, it, it seems to adore people. Uh, I, I'm not too sure, but it just calls to us in so many ways and so many health impacts. Uh, we planted extensively at the Lyle Center just so we can develop these relationships with it, protect it, harvest it. And it's just been a wonderful relationship that we have with these trees. Them. Um, how often do you take the syrup? I'm sure. Do you make your own? And yeah, we have to. We, we cook it up. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm so healthy. I only have it once a year. But the flowers, I have it throughout the entire spring through summer. So the bloom season is really from March almost all the way through September. So I can harvest right. those flowers uh, pretty much six months of the year. And then even with that, I storm. So I, I drink flowers at least once once a week, once every two weeks. Okay, cool. Yeah, I didn't know of that. I only knew of the syrup. Yeah, it's really an earthy, uh, it's a good, 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 good flavor. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. All right. And then next up from Elena, she asked, how is the longevity of the dyes you've made? Are there any dyes in particular that are the best to make or maybe that um, have the longest longevity? No, I'm so glad. <laughs> I'm so glad for this. Okay. Who, who asked that? Uh, Elena. Elena. So Elena, it's all about tannins. The more tannins in your product, the longer lasting. So by far, the, the longest lasting dyes I have found have been willow, redbud, uh, eucalyptus, um, even avocado skins. I've only used the skins. I've never used the pits. Um, even avocado skins have great longevity, but really the willow is by far my favorite. It just sticks in there uh, every wash. And the neat thing about those high tannins is that they age differently depending on how you get them dirty. So if it's grease, they're gonna change the color. So it's really, you got this really interactive towel now. Um, and if you really use it, it, it really just changes and alters. It's just a fun, yeah, that's a, so you want really high, high tannins. Um, even the pine cones that they don't make a very vivid cover color, but they're so rich in tannins that they just stick. It's just, just pink that just persists. Uh, that is, that's a wonderful question. I might have to change my dye to being maybe mixing some pine cones in there. So I don't have to collect so many <laughs> avocados. Oh, Nicole, you're like me. I just eat stuff I could dye now. Right? No, yeah. no, 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 no. <laughs> All right, and then next up from Krista, she asked, are we harming the environment by cultivating non-native plants? Holy moly, do we have enough time for this one? <laughs> listen, so listen, all modern arguments are gonna be between environmentalists and there is no one answer to answer that question. We live in infinite shades of gray. There's no 100% natives and 100% not natives. But I do know this, Krista, is that we have to feed and house 40 million people. And we can't do that with just native plants. 
And spontaneous plants is our mother's reaction to our impacts on the land. In fact, black mustard, which just absolutely dominates the state of California, is a car follower. It is just an effect of the nitrogen oxides coming out of your tailpipes. And it is the number one health food. It's got so many health impacts. Incredible. It's a superfood. It, so, no, I, I, I don't... When you say plant, if you noticed, all my trees were spontaneous. They are an, in, an impact, an effect of our impact on the land. And so I'm honoring these gifts that our mother gives us as a response to our impacts on the land. And, and I love natives. My very first book in the 1980s was in, you know, on native plants, and I absolutely love them. But I just can't see native plants solving all 40 million problems that we have in state. And, and that's our challenge is how do we power up and how do we food feed and, and how do we house uh, these, these massive people without using an incredible amount of fossils. And it's going to take every plant because we have every culture in California. We're probably going to need every plant in California to satisfy those needs. And this is my opinion. Okay. Everybody in this room is, I know they're environmentalists and they've got an opinion just as strong as I do. So thank you for letting me say mine. I appreciate that. Yeah. Chris has said she loved your answer. And then I see Marcus oh. has his um, hand up. So if you want to unmute, you can go ahead and ask yours and then we'll get to the other question. Yeah. Thank, thank, thank you. Uh, this was great, Doug. Uh, really appreciate it. And, and thank you for, um, just talking about the, the reciprocal relationship, I think when, when you were noting that a lot of these plants that you were harvesting were like, they needed that help. They, they needed to be cut yeah. back. So there's really this relationship. One thing that I have to deal with often is when some of these plants don't need that, <laughs> that cutting. And then we mm. have folks coming out to harvest Right. And it's like, okay, wait, like, you know, this is actually a restoration site and we have these key species that we're trying to, to restore this mm -hmm. habitat for. And then we have folks collecting white sage to smudge. Um, so that was one, one part, like, how do you balance that? How do you communicate that balance? And then the, uh, the other question I have was, was even along the lines of, of the, the non-native um, question, I'm trying to find uses for all non-native plants because then if folks are out there harvesting those, I don't have to have all these weed uh, volunteer, weeding right. volunteer event days <laughs> because right. folks are gonna be pulling out all these weeds for us, right? But I'm there's a couple of plants that I'm thinking in particular. Have you found any use for Arundo? Yeah. And have you found any use for um, uh, Tree of Heaven? Because one, we, we, I was making uh, paper. I was making paper with Arundo. Yeah. And um, the Tree of Heaven, it's just, it's so hard to find a use. And I'm, I'm hoping like once, once we find that, that use, we're going to, we're going to be in the, in, in the gold. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So Arundo, so, you know, Arundo is not, you don't want to hear this, but it is phenomenal. You'll only find it in waters with high, uh, hydrocarbons. It is the number one cleaner. It is cleaning your water. You won't find it in clean waters. So just the very fact that you're finding it means it is doing its job. You're, you're not going to find it in the Sierras. You're not going to find it in Mount Baldy because the waters are too clean. They're only in waters in, in polluted waters. In, in fact, that, that huge refugee crisis that we had on the border of Texas, all those uh, Haitians were making their structures out of Arundo. So what was incredible about that picture was that the Arundo was cleaning the water, then providing actually emergency housing. And I'm all, oh my God, pollution came to the rescue, uh, you know, for these refugees. So Arundo, actually, what we do is we make rope out of it makes a really strong rope, uh, really tough on your fingers. Um, now the Alianthus, the tree of heaven is just tough. The only use I've ever found for that was weed control. It has got allopaleic agents like crazy. It is a rank smelling tree, just working with that tree and you smell. I mean, it's a natural form of birth control, a full day of working with that tree. Nobody wants to stand next to you. Um, 
So I've only found it as mulch. I've been looking for a use just like you do because I keep thinking it's a gift and I need to see it as a gift and not as this other thing. And and so I'm still looking, <laughs> Marcus. I'm, <laughs> I'll email you. I got your email. So I'll, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, great. So next. that was an incredible question. Yeah. <laughs> Next we have from Katya again, what tips do you have for beginner foragers? And I'm also gonna piggyback off that question. Of course, we've been talking all about trees, but I know you have so much information on things we can forage that aren't from trees. So maybe in that same vein, what are maybe some beginner things that people can forage that are from plants as opposed to just trees? So I'll tell you, over 90% of the weeds outside your front door are edible you'd be hard pressed to find a poisonous weed outside your door. That's how much your mother loves you. And so just get a basic book, whether it's my book and there's other great sailing. We have that guy out in uh, Lancaster who is the number one foraging um, guy. He runs a survival school. His book is wonderful. Get a book on weeds. Uh, there's a website um, that's eattheweeds.com. Um, and just start there. These weeds, once you notice them, um, there's medicine to remove warts, there's painkillers, there's all kinds of stuff you find really within 10 feet of your, of your front door. And I don't know if that answered, but really uh, just start with a basic book. In my book, I think you can find it for like nine bucks right now. Um, um, so yeah, yeah. I don't, they're really easy to identify and I mean, you've got to go out of your way to poison yourself. I mean, you, you really, that's how rich we really are right outside our door. All right. Awesome. Yes. And I did drop the link to his book if you scroll up in the chat. Um, and I will definitely, I definitely agree with that. One of the first things that I forged was nettle and chipweed. Oh. And people think those are, think of those as weeds. And uh, there's so many in the backyard. Oh, chickweed is delicious. One of my all-time favorites. And it's a superfood. Yeah, I know. I went to my um, aunt and uncle's house and I picked it from their yard and I didn't tell them because they didn't know it was back there and they have quite a lot of land and I brought it inside and she was like, oh, that looks so nice. Where did you get that from? Did you bring that? And I was like, no, it's in your backyard. You can eat it. And she's like, oh, show me where it is. And I showed it to her. So I don't know if she's eaten it since then, but she was impressed and she didn't even know it was out there for her. All right. And then Elkin asks, how can we take in-person classes about foraging? Oh, well, there's that survivalist um, person. You know, um, I do work with the El Dorado Nature Center in Long Beach and then the Environmental Nature Center in Newport Beach. Those are the only two places I currently run classes, except for at the Lyle Center. Um, but if you're interested, just let's get an event going with sustainable Claremont and just let's meet at the Claremont colleges and just march around and bring a big basket and you'll see by the end of the hour walk well your basket will be full of stuff so we can organize um something too just with this group if you want I I mean like Marco said you guys are my people and we're all here so you know that would be fun it would be a, a load of fun that would be awesome I would definitely love that um, all right. Then somebody con um, commented about the tree of heaven, said that they use the sticks as parrot perches, and perhaps they can be donated to an animal shelter. Also, they make great stakes for nursery growers. That's something to look at. Hey, thank you, Landscape Materials. All right, okay. Oh, and they make a, yeah, they, uh, Marcus, they're a coppice crop. So if you cut them down, they'll just crown sprout, right? And then that's where your stakes come. So I know they they really respond to coppicing. Am I pronouncing that right? Coppicing. Um, so it's just the constant of whacking it down to the ground and letting those new water sprouts or, or sprouts to, to spring up. Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Thanks, whoever said that. Stakes. Great. And then I think Stuart had a couple questions and then while he's talking, if anybody else has more, go ahead and drop them because we only got a couple minutes left. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask a few. My biggest question, but I think it's been asked, answered by now is I'm just afraid that I'm going to kill myself eating something I shouldn't when I'm forging. But it sounds like that's not something to be too worried about, especially that that website um, uh, that you, you had mentioned, uh, Eat the Weeds and some other books and resources. I think would go a long way in abating those fears. Um, so yeah. 
I, the question I've got for you, Doug, is kind of a, a very broad question. Um, where do you learn all this? Is this from, uh, this seems like a lot of lessons from people who have lived here for generations and like tribal communities and indigenous communities. How is this um, information best passed on? Or like where, when you go to do your research for this, um, where are you looking? Um, what's, so to, I started gardening when I was 14 years old and my, my mentor was a depression era gardener. That's where I went to where we, when you didn't have food, right? Like they didn't have anything during the depression. They didn't, that was the victory garden. Everybody knew about weeds. Everybody knew about all this stuff. So I, I whoever you are, whatever culture you're from, talk to your elders, talk to your old family members. They are the ones with the stories. They are the ones that really know the information. They're the place to start. I mean, our state is rich with authors and expertise and I've read a whole, I mean, a load of stuff. Um, the, the Early Native American Uses is one of the best books um, by Clark, I think Dennis Clark. Um, but you know, it all started with my elders. I cannot, and when I get my classes, I get these 20 year olds and I, and I get the Asian people in, I say, talk to your elders about these plants. And all of a sudden, 16 weeks later, I'm getting all kinds of new information coming into my classes because they are getting this new information and I'm learning from new cultures. And I, I just can't stress enough as we really need to connect to our, our elders. So Great. And then uh, another question I have is, do you see any of um, like some trends with any of these um, uh, items becoming more like, available or being harvested at like some scale? I, I just sort of randomly got a Facebook ad for um, acorn flower um, the <laughs> other day. Um, and, you know, as some of these things are, you know, fairly common, like pine nuts or, or whatever. But do you see like any like trends with people trying to kind of capitalize on um, uh, these yeah. items? Or... I do. I see there's an organization in, in Northern California called the Fiber Shed, and they're all about creating textiles. So that's the dyes, that's the fibers, that's the cloths. They want to create a whole ecosystem of textiles, which makes sense. Uh, which, I mean, who does, right? This is a daily consumption and that meets a vital need. We have organizations like Angel City Lumber and, and West Coast Arborist that are really getting in the milling and making sure that these trees don't get cut up for firewood and that they're repurposed and reused. Uh, we have a, a farm in Compton right now that grows um, the sheep, I mean, the goats that are just used for fiber. So she's making uh, goats for, for uh, shirts, skirts, uh, tablecloths, all kinds of stuff. So I think we're really seeing um, um, the, re the regeneration of the resources needed to sustain humans. That's really the ultimate goal is how are we going to sustain these 40 million people? And I think there is a big movement uh, for that. I think the only problem is that um, Southern Cal has gotten so dense. We have 19 million people packed in one fifth of the state and there's no places to garden anymore. That maybe explains why I'm into foraging more than anything else, because there was nothing available for me, you know? I mean, there's more native gardens than there are um, textile gardens, than there are timber gardens, than there are, you know? And it, 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 uh, at some point, we really got to take care of these 19 million people if we want to get off this fossil kick. All right, I got to, that was my two cents, Stuart. I just got to shut up. Because there are some good opinions in this room, and I, I, we really need to open it up to some of these other neat opinions. Yeah, no, that was great. Thank you for that. Um, Nicole, I, I've gone through my questions. Are there any more that have been asked, or does anybody else have any questions out there? I saw any, unless somebody has a quick one they want to. Well, I've, I've, I've met Mr. Richard Haskell um, before, and yeah, how's it going? It's been ages. You've been at the Lyle Center, haven't you? Yeah, 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 yeah. Good to see you here. Is Anne, is Annie Pandy here? And I don't think she's. I don't think she's in. Okay. Uh, too bad. Okay. Just she's <laughs> not. But we still are in constant contact with Anne. Anne was on our board for a good amount of time. She's yeah. She's just great. wonderful individual. And that's very funny that you say you know Richard. I feel like everybody knows Richard. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody always knows Richard. 
Uh, Doug, Doug do, you, do you really commute from Orange? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, 27 miles. So it's it's two buses and three bike rides. It takes two hours. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I was just, you mentioned you're biking. I was thinking, whoa. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> no, no, no. It's, it's uphill the whole way. <laughs> oh, yeah, thighs and legs of steel. <laughs> No, that's not me. <laughs> All right, then. Um, I think that's it. Then. And we are right at eight o'clock. So we ended right on time. I want to thank you so much for doing this for us, Doug. Um, so, so much information. I've already got so many tabs open that I'm going to look up after we're done here. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us, um, everybody who is in the call, thank you for joining us as well. As Stuart said in the beginning of the call, we do have another dialogue this week about our relationship with nature and how it can help our mental health. So be sure to check that out on our website or Facebook or Instagram. Um, and yeah, that's it. Thank you everybody for coming. Thanks you guys. All right, Thanks, you're Doug. appreciated. You're thank you so much, Doug. Thank you All everyone. Right. All right, hope our paths cross soon. Thanks, right. have a good All evening right. everybody. Take care everyone.